Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, I'm not going to run around like Mark did, because I'm really nervous. So I'm just going to hold on to this podium for dear life. Um, I'm worried that I'll be a bit of an anti-climax after the earthquake. <laughs> It's St. Patrick's Day, and I was crowned Little Miss Ireland when I was two, so we'll persevere. <laughs> Speaking of which, the Times had a classic correction today, reading, St. Patrick banished the snakes from Ireland, not the slaves, as our story said. <laughs> At Barack Obama's 2008 inauguration, Washington was swept up in a magical mood. For the first time, the city where I was born seemed truly integrated, the races mingling together with an infectious joy. We were on the cusp of an era that promised to move beyond racism, extreme partisanship, beyond bullying and bellicosity. It would be a leap into modernity, a time, as our handsome, smarty-pants new president promised, when government would be cool again and work again, and when blue and red would blend together into a lovely purple U. I decided to give a party the night before the inauguration. This would later become known as the worst party in Washington history. <laughs> Alan Greenspan accused me of having a toga party. That's OK. He's no John Belushi. And he turned out to be wrong about everything. I never give parties, and I'm terrible at it. So somehow, about 500 people got invited or just crashed. The ones who came fashionably late, like Tom Hanks and Ben Affleck and Bruce Springsteen and the publisher of The Washington Post and the executive editor of The New York Times, all ended up outside on the street in the freezing cold, unable to get in, with Tom Hanks pathetically yelling for someone to toss a beer out the window. <laughs> the ones who came unfashionably early, young and thirsty bloggers whom I'd never met, stayed all night slurping my goose, as the bartender referred to the Grey Goose vodka. But it was such a historic moment that I put aside my disappointment about not getting to meet the boss and Forrest Gump, woke up at 4 AM the next day, and rounded up my groggy house guests to go down and greet the historic dawn at my favorite monument in DC, the Lincoln Memorial. We bundled up, took a picnic of croissant and champagne, piled in some taxis, got out in the dark, and started walking up to the moonlit memorial past the scaffolding where a stage had been built for stars to serenade the president a couple of nights earlier. Suddenly, a slab of a man rose up before me. The monument's closed, he said. I had never seen the monument closed, and I was confused. Are you park police, I asked? No, he said. Are you DC police, I wondered? No, he said. Are you Secret Service? No. Finally, he growled at me, I am Beyonce security. <laughs> I protested that while Beyonce was really talented, she wasn't even there, and she really didn't have the power to close a national monument. She could put a ring on it, but not a ring around it. <laughs> but her security guard glowered. My friends glared at me as we trudged back down the hill. I never thought, five years later, another twerking diva would once more shut down the Lincoln Memorial. But I underestimated Michelle Bachman. <laughs> For a moment last October, in the midst of the government shutdown, when a Canadian named Ted Cruz was trying to turn Washington into Mad Max Thunderdome, and self-destructive Republicans were garnering the worst poll numbers in the history of polling, it looked like the GOP was really going to be on the run. But we didn't know that the computer geniuses who engineered Barack Obama's historic election twice wouldn't be able to set up a simple website that would allow people to sign up for health insurance. 
why didn't the White House just bring in a bunch of 13-year-olds in a case of Red Bull? <laughs> because of that, within a few weeks of the shutdown, Democrats were on the run. And now we're back to the same old food fight in Washington. You want to know how dysfunctional the nation's capital is? Let's talk about immigration reform. A hot topic, a big topic, something that businesses across the country want. It's a massive societal problem. It's the key to our demographic future. The Senate has stepped up to the plate and passed a major immigration policy bill that tightens the borders and creates a way for the 12 million Hispanics in the country to become legal and productive members of society. The president totally wants this for his legacy. He sees it as a major accomplishment that he hopes to achieve by the end of his term. After health care, it's the biggest social policy priority he has. The Speaker of the House and leader of the Republicans, John Boehner, has said repeatedly that he wants a sweeping immigration overhaul for the good of the country and his own party. The Senate has done it, the President wants it, and the Speaker and the rest of the House Republican leadership support it. So where is it? Nowhere. It's not passing because a few Tea Party loonies like Steve King, Michelle Bachman, and Louis Gomer don't want it. Something that the whole Washington political apparatus wants is held hostage to the whims of Michelle Bachman, who is not even running again. That tells you in a nutshell, nuts included, what a mess Washington is. After 9-11, the country went into a crouch, fearful that our democracy would be destroyed from the outside. We didn't understand that the real danger to our democracy would come from the inside. Eight years ago, I wrote a book called Our Men Necessary. I had to admit, in the end, that the little deers had their occasional uses. <laughs> but these days, I'm writing about something that really seems to have no utility whatsoever, even though it's as integral to our lives as the opposite sex. Now I have to ask myself, is Washington necessary? Washington has long been seen as more officious than efficient, kind of like your bloated, slow-moving Uncle Ned who shambles along and spills the gravy on the nice tablecloth at Thanksgiving. But you always know that when you're threatened, Uncle Ned's going to be the first guy there to help you. Now, however, things on the Potomac have deteriorated to the point where Washington is seen as the threat, like that sheriff in Mel Brooks' blazing saddles who held the gun to his own head. Barack Obama's pledge to change the corrosive tone of Washington came true. It is now, sadly, way worse than it was before he was president, and that includes his Democratic predecessor getting impeached. The blue states are bluer, and the red states are redder. His exciting first election, which many believed would be a bomb on past divisions, turned out to be more like a bomb deepening those divisions. When the president was trying to negotiate a tense moment with Vladimir Putin on the phone recently about the Ukraine, Sarah Palin weighed in with a vituperative fashion review of the jeans he was wearing in the Oval Office as he talked on the phone with Putin, a look Stephen Colbert dubbed casual doomsday. <laughs> Meanwhile, Colbert noted, on the other end, you know, Putin is shirtless, stroking a tiger, looking into an infinity mirror. <laughs> Palin, still playing the Klingon to the president Spock, told Sean Hannity, speaking in her unique Yoda-like syntax, <laughs> people are looking at Putin as one who wrestles bears and drills for oil. They look at our president as one who wears mom jeans and equivocates and bloviates. John McCain's Frankenstein now has her own Frankenstein, Ted Cruz, and that unholy pair are infecting politics with a strain of mean-spiritedness. Palin is helping Tea Party candidates challenge establishment Republicans in 2014, candidates who share her dream, the dream of preventing poor people from seeing doctors. Paul Ryan is no slouch on the Scrooge front either. He told conservatives in Washington last week that he could not support school lunches for underprivileged kids. What they're offering people, he said, is a full stomach and an empty soul. 
We've gotten into this weird cycle. The president was elected with young people and minorities turning out in droves to support him. Then you've got a midterm election in, two, in 2010 where the turnout is lower and a bunch of conservatives get elected to the House and Senate after the Tea Party launches some primaries and attacks on the old line Republicans who were there. Then 2012 rolls around. Obama wins again. House Democrats get a million more votes nationwide than Republicans, but Republicans in these specially drawn conservative districts hold on to power. It's a recipe for paralysis. The Republican Party is now bizarro world. Everything reels backwards. The party that always worked hand in pocket with lobbyists now hates K Street. The party that always did the bidding of big business and Wall Street didn't seem to give a fig if we had a federal default that would cause the markets to collapse. The party that used to be for fiscal responsibility didn't mind shutting down the government and costing millions a day. The chest slumping party that pushed to go to Iraq and Afghanistan now refused to let President Obama attack Syria over its use of chemical weapons, acting like he was a reckless warmonger. And now congressional Democrats are at war with the Democratic administration. Everybody's pursuing criminal investigations of everybody else. It started when the CIA hacked into computers that Senate Intelligence Committee staffers were using in the basement of a CIA facility because the spy agency thought its congressional overseers had hacked into the CIA network to purloin hidden documents on torture. You know, it makes Homeland pale in comparison. <laughs> president Obama, the former constitutional law teacher who became president vowing to clean up the excesses and constitutional corrosion of W. and Cheney, will now have to clean up the excesses and constitutional corrosion in his own administration. The president and I have always had a very special relationship. The first time I met him, he took my hand and said, stop making fun of my ears. <laughs> and the strong feelings he had for me only grew from there. Once, when Obama traveled to Europe during the 2008 campaign, I got an interview with him on his plane, oh, Force One. At the end of the interview, he asked if he could talk to me alone for a minute. His press secretaries vanished. I figured now I was really going to get some inside dope, the sort of juicy stuff Scotty Reston or Bob Woodward scored. I was sitting on the edge of my seat. Obama looked at me somberly, his brown eyes locking into my brown eyes. You, he said, are really irritating. <laughs> While I looked at him stricken, he repeated it. I was upset afterwards, but then I decided that Barack Obama was simply proud, like Mr. Darcy in Pride and Prejudice. He would figure out that I was likable enough, like Hillary. And sure enough, when he became president, his favorite journalist became a New York Times columnist, David Brooks. <laughs> Mr. Darcy and David Brooks, it just doesn't have much of a ring to it. The president is self-contained, but he's also very sensitive. With Dick Cheney, you could write anything. I dubbed him Darth Vader, and he began proudly calling himself that. I wrote that he had a room in the White House basement with pentagrams where he spoke an ancient language and made love to a goat devil. <laughs> he was fine with it. <laughs> My main critique of President Obama is that he's like Luke Skywalker. He has the force. He just doesn't always know how to channel it. He ends up too often looking like a bystander to his own presidency, a Paul who pulled off a historic victory even though he doesn't like politics. As one top Democrat put it, it's as though Bill Gates got to be Bill Gates without liking computers. Even after Democrats upended the entire Senate, changing the filibuster rule and rigging the game to get Obama's nominees through on a majority vote, the president couldn't get his nominee to lead the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division through. As the graying Obama noted last week about his presidency, I don't have time to waste. The clock is ticking. Yet the Onion satirical website captured the lame duck tone of his presidency with the headline, 
Obama spends afternoon in garage restoring classic drone. <laughs> the president is headed for a thumping, to use W's word, in the midterms. W also suffered the same thumping. And he'll finish up with the tough final two years. With 2016 upon us, it's time now to contemplate some fresh leadership in the White House. It will be so exciting. We'll have our choice between a Clinton or a Bush. Oi. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>